of them believed the Earth was flat. Then one day, a map maker named Christopher Columbus had an idea. Do you know what? I think the world isn't flat at all. I think it's round like a ball. Did you hear what he said? Did you hear what he said? He said that the world is round. Oh, he's crazy. I think the world isn't flat at all. I think it's round like a ball. The world's as flat as the brim of your hat, and that is very plain. I know that I'm right. Oh, I know that I'm right when I say that the world is round. Oh. My thinking is sound, and I'll prove the world's round. It won't take very long. But it did take long, seven long years, before Columbus could convince a king or a queen to let him try out his idea. Then Queen Isabella of Spain agreed to supply the ships and men for his trip. I will discover a shortcut to India and bring back some of the great wealth I find there. And I can do it, for I know the world is round. And instead of going east to India, I shall sail west and reach India around the other way. It will be a shorter and cheaper way, for I'll do it all by sea. Queen Isabella provided Columbus with three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. And on August 3rd, 1492, they set sail across the unknown Atlantic. I The ships sailed onward, but two long months after they started, there was still no sign of land ahead. Turn back, Columbus! Turn back, Columbus! We'll not turn back until we find India! Onward, men! By October 10th, the sailors and the crew were ready to take matters into their own hands. If Columbus won't do as we ask, we'll put him in chains. And we'll turn the ships around ourselves. Wait, have you heard? One of our men has just seen a branch in the ocean. What of it? It had fresh berries on it. That means we're near land. Hooray! Two days later, the ships reached land, and Columbus and his crew saw the people with reddish-brown skins who lived there. Oh, I think it is rather surprising that they should have reddish brown skins. But now since we have landed in India, then these people must be Indians. We'll call this part of India San Salvador. And I take possession of it in the name of the King and Queen of Spain. The people Columbus called Indians were very friendly, and they gave Columbus and his men many gifts but not the rich jewels and gold for which they had come. For Columbus really wasn't in India at all. He was on one of the islands off the coast of America. But because of Columbus's mistake, the natives of America have been called Indians ever since. Columbus visited other islands near San Salvador, looking for the great wealth of India. And then he and some of his men returned to Spain. Columbus had no trouble getting ships and men for his second voyage, but he still hadn't the slightest idea that he was headed for the vast continent of America, and that he would have had to cross it and sail over the Pacific Ocean before he could reach India by traveling west. The men of Europe were no longer afraid of the ocean. Columbus made two more voyages, and other explorers followed. But each year on October 12th, we celebrate Columbus Day the anniversary of that day in 1492, when Columbus first sighted the land of the new world, America. Listen to my story and listen to it well. I'll tell you of a great man who served his country well. His name was Daniel Boone and he wore a coonskin hat. And his clothes were made of buckskin, now what do you think of that? 
Dan was born in Pennsylvania in 1734, in colony days before the Revolutionary War. He was famous as a hunter while he was still a boy, and the hours he spent in the forest, they were his greatest joy. <coughs> Did you hear that? That was Daniel Boone with his long rifle out hunting a bear. Listen. <coughs> He got him. Daniel Boone shot that bear. That was when Daniel was only 15 years old. Yes, Daniel Boone was the greatest hunter and explorer this country ever had. Now, sometimes Dan hunted bears. And sometimes wildcats. And other times the timber wolf. Daniel Boone loved to explore, too, and he was one of the first pioneers to see the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Blue Grass region of Kentucky. Oh, Daniel knew the forest, he knew the forest well, the mountains and the rivers and where the animals dwell. He was handy with a rifle and with a hunting knife, and he loved the open spaces, the cleanest kind of life. Of course, there were other dangers in the forest in those days besides wild animals. There were Indians, and one day when Daniel was exploring a cut in the mountains where Kentucky, Virginia, and Tennessee meet, an area known as Cumberland Gap, he knew there were Indians ahead, unfriendly Indians. Quickly, Daniel turned around, and silently he cut back on his own trail, but the Indians were behind him, too. Dan was surrounded. Dan fought like a wildcat. But the odds were just too great. He was captured and taken to the Indians' camp. The Indians knew Daniel's reputation, and they tied him to a tree post to prevent his escape. That night, when the Indians were asleep, Dan found a sharp piece of bark right back of where his hands were tied. Slowly and painfully, he rubbed the leather cord against the bark until at last he was free. Then, as quiet as a cat, he escaped. The Indians followed, but Daniel covered ground so fast that he left their swiftest runners behind. He covered 160 miles on foot in four days, and he met his friends, settlers from back east at Cumberland Gap. During the Revolutionary War, Dan was a major in the American Army, and his great knowledge of forestry and wood lore came in handy when he fought the British and the Indians on the British side. But he was friendly to many Indians because... Daniel was a fair man to red men and to white And he never used his rifle unless he had to fight He didn't like big cities, he kept on moving west And he helped to build our country and tame the wilderness When the Revolutionary War was over, Dan kept heading west Until he made his final home in Missouri There he would sit under a tree during the day And settlers and Indians came to him with their problems for he was a man of great justice and simple democracy. His tree became famous as Boone's Judgment Tree. Often Dan sat under it and remembered his old battles and adventures, and he would fondly dream of his hunting days <coughs> when he hunted the big bear and the savage wildcat and the wild timber wolf. And now you've heard my story, there is no more to tell. The story of Daniel Boone, who served his country well. His clothes were made of buckskin and he wore a coonskin hat. A democratic pioneer, I hope you'll remember that. Many, many years ago, when the people of Israel were a great nation ruled by King Saul, they fought a long and bitter war against their ancient enemies, the Philistines. 
In those days, soldiers used swords and spears and bows and arrows, and they wore heavy armor and carried shields to protect themselves in battle, so that only the biggest and strongest men were taken into the army. Well, in this war, the Israelites and the Philistines were pretty evenly matched. They fought many hard battles, and each side lost many men, but neither side could completely conquer the other. Then one day, while the Philistines were camped on one side of the great valley and the Israelites on the other, there came out of the camp of the Philistines a champion of their cause, a huge giant, taller and stronger and bigger than any man anyone had ever seen. He wore very heavy armor, and his face was fierce and cruel. So fierce and cruel that it would strike fear into the hearts of the bravest. This was Goliath, the giant of Gath. He strode to the center of the valley, faced the armies of Israel, and in a voice like thunder, he hurled this defiance at them. I am Goliath, the giant of Gath and the Philistines have chosen me as their champion. You, soldiers of Israel, choose a man for you, and let him come down here and fight with me. If he kills me, we will be the servants of Israel. If I kill him, you will be slaves to the Philistines. I defy any man to accept my challenge. When the men of Israel saw Goliath and heard his defiant challenge, they were afraid, for they had no one to match his size and strength. Not one among them dared go down and do battle with the giants. Not, that is, until the shepherd boy David heard Goliath's challenge. Now David was just a boy. He knew nothing about swords and spears and fighting wars. But he was a thoughtful boy, too, and a good boy, because he believed in God and trusted in him. So, when he heard Goliath defying King Saul's army, he turned to his brothers and said, In defying the army of Israel, Goliath defies God. Is there no one here to go out and do battle against the enemy of the Lord? David's brothers were first surprised and then angry at him. Go back to your flocks and leave wars to fighting men. But David wouldn't be put off. I will do it, he said. Send word to King Saul. Tell him that I will go down into the valley and do battle with Goliath the giant. When the king saw how determined David was, he gave him his blessing and offered him his own royal armor and sword. But David wouldn't take them. He wasn't a soldier. Instead, he went to a nearby stream and selected five smooth stones. He put these in his shepherd's bag. He took his stick in his left hand, and in his right hand he held a slingshot. That's all. With both armies looking on, excited and expectant, David went down into the valley to meet Goliath. They met in the middle of the valley. David looking up at the giant, confident and unafraid, and Goliath looking down on the unarmed boy with eyes full of hatred. Suddenly, the giant Philistine roared in a terrible fury. I have defied all the armies of Israel to give me a man to fight, and they have sent a boy against me. What? Am I a dog that you come against me with a stick? David answered him calmly. I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Your sword and your spear and your shield will not save you, Goliath. For this day, you shall learn that the Lord fights on the side of right. Goliath let out an angry snarl. So be it. Defend yourself, boy. Goliath the giant rushed forward to make quick work of the boy champion of the Israelites. David stood his ground. He reached into his shepherd's bag, took out one stone. He fixed it in his slingshot and he let it fly. The giant was dead, and the simple shepherd boy, who trusted in God, 
had done what all of King Saul's army hadn't been able to do. David lifted his eyes to heaven and he whispered a prayer. Long ago, in the wild backwoods of a country named Greece, a little baby girl, Diana, was traveling by horseback to the city of Athens with her mother and father. It was dangerous to travel through the rough, lonely country. Bands of robbers hid there. Even now, dark, cruel eyes watched little Diana and her parents as they went slowly on their way. Ahead of them was a clearing. Here, the bandits plan to seize Diana and her family and hold them for ransom. Behind the rocks and trees that surrounded the clearing, the robbers hid themselves. Just as Diana's father led the horses out of the forest, the bandits sprung out screaming and waving their swords. Diana's father fought back fiercely, but there were too many for him. The bandits hurried to tie him to his horse. Suddenly, one robber shouted, a signal, a signal from the lookout. Hunters are coming. Afraid of the brave hunters, the bandits rushed away with their captives. But in their haste, they left little Diana behind. Only a few minutes passed. Then the hunters broke into the clearing. But they were too late. The bandits had escaped. The hunters did not know what had happened to Diana's parents. They asked her where she came from. She was only a baby, and she couldn't tell them. Not knowing what else to do, they took the little girl home with them to raise as their own child. As Diana grew into a young girl, she learned to be a huntress. Among all the children, only her best friend, a handsome boy named Melanion, could ride as well, shoot as straight, or run as fast as Diana. She was so happy staying with the hunters and her good friend Melanion, she almost forgot she had a mother and father of her own. Diana's mother and father were held captives for many years. Finally, they escaped. In all that time, they never gave up hope that they would find their daughter. One day, a soldier who had been hunting in the back country came to Diana's parents and told them he had seen a beautiful young girl. Soon, Diana's happy parents found her, and they all decided she would go back to the city with them. Diana tried not to cry when she had to leave. She called back to Melanion, When we are grown up, I will marry you. And she rode away. Diana went to school and grew up to be a beautiful young lady, but she never forgot her happy years in the country. She never forgot how to ride, to run, and to shoot, and she never forgot her promise to Melanion. Many young men wished to marry Diana. Her parents thought a girl of her age should take a husband. It had been many years since she had seen Melanion, so Diana, to please her mother and father, promised to marry the first young man who could outrun her in a race. Many tried, but no one could run as fast as Diana. The people of Athens came by the hundreds to watch the races. Diana was their favorite. They cheered and laughed as she sprinted far ahead of her closest rivals. The onlookers tossed presents to her, and even during the race, Diana could pick up a gift and keep running fast enough to win easily. One day, a handsome soldier stepped close to her and said, Diana, will you run against me? Diana's heart beat faster. It was Melanion. 
She smiled, for she remembered that as children, only Melanion could run faster than she. But her heart sank when she saw the large scar of a battle wound on his leg. They prepared to race. Knowing how she hoped Melanion would win, Diana's father gave the young soldier three golden apples and whispered something in his ear. At the line, a voice called, Go! Melanion sprang into the lead. Diana's friends cheered her on. She had to try as hard as she could. Diana began to gain. Out in front of her, he tossed a golden apple. She scooped it up. Melanion held his lead. Diana began to gain. Again, Melanion threw out a golden apple. She swerved to pick it up. The crowd cheered, but Melanion was still in front. Now the finish line was in sight. Diana was gaining. Melanion dropped the last apple. Diana reached down. The third apple was much heavier. For a split second, she slowed, then regained her speed. Just as she was about to catch him, Melanion crossed the finish line ahead of her. Though she had lost the race, all of Diana's friends were happy because she married her childhood sweetheart and lived happily ever after. celebrated day of the year. Wonderful shows were prepared to entertain the king and the prince. At the end of the program, a lone figure stood before the king with a beautiful horse. Your majesty, I beg thee, look upon this wondrous animal. It is not real, but an ingenious machine that will carry me anywhere I wish, just by turning a peg. Well, if true, it is indeed a wonderful animal. What is the price? It is not for sale, sire but I would exchange it for a portion of your kingdom. Well, for such a trade, I must know more about this horse. My son, Prince Brahma, will test the animal for me. The owner started to show the prince how to control the horse. But before he could tell him all, Prince Brahma turned the peg and away he flew. He doesn't know how to bring it back. It's a trick to kidnap the prince. Throw this man in jail until my son returns. As the horse's owner was taken away, the king scanned the skies for the flying prince, but he was out of sight. High above the clouds flew the enchanted horse with the frightened prince. He traveled hundreds of miles, but he couldn't control the animal. He twisted the peg, but the horse continued to fly upward and onward. At last he found a small knob behind the animal's ear. He gave it a turn and the enchanted horse started to descend. As he came closer to earth, the prince saw he was in a strange kingdom. I will be in danger if I'm found, but I can't control the horse. The amazing animal carried Prince Brahma toward a palace courtyard. After I land, I'll turn the pig, and maybe it will fly away again, perhaps right back to my own country. So intent was the prince on the controls that he didn't watch the archway through which the horse flew. He was knocked off the horse into a courtyard. No one saw him, and while everyone crowded about the mysterious horse, Prince Prama hid in a room. After studying the horse, the king gave out an order. This is a most unusual animal. I shall give it as a gift to Princess Serena. Yeah, perhaps then she'll be my bride. Take the animal to the stable until I'm ready to give it to her. Prince Prama could hear the king's orders, and now he realized his chance of escaping was gone. Then he heard someone sobbing. He discovered that he was in the room of Princess Serena. She was the most beautiful girl he had ever seen. She looked up and saw the prince staring at her. Who are you? I'm Prince Prama. I come from far away. Don't let them know I'm here. Oh, did my father send you to rescue me from King Agnir? No, but perhaps I can help. Tell me how you came to this place. 
Princess Serena then told Prince Prama the story of how she was captured by the powerful King Agmir. She must marry him or be put to death. I have an idea. If you pretend to be ill, the king will have to postpone any decision until you're well. I'll hide out in the city and return when the time is right. The princess agreed, and she acted as if she were in a trance. And soon the whole palace was alarmed. Word got to the king about her illness. Send for the best doctors in the kingdom. Each doctor who came tried to cure the young girl, and each failed. King Agmir sent out a call to physicians from other lands. One day, a strange doctor came to the palace. I can cure the princess, but I must attend her alone. When the doctor was alone in the sick girl's room, he spoke to her. Princess Serena, arise, for it is time for us to leave. Prince Prama, it is you? Yes, Serena, but we must play the game for a while yet. Now we will see the king. Sire, you see she is almost cured already. Now, some special unusual gift from you may complete the treatment. How fortunate. I have been saving a most unique horse to give to the princess. So the enchanted horse was brought to the palace. It's beautiful. May I sit in the saddle? Of course, my dear. It's yours. Prince Prama helped Princess Serena up on the horse. Then he turned to the king. You see, sire, she is cured. Now for my fee. Of course, good doctor. What is your wish? I wish the princess myself. He jumped behind Serena. Never! She is mine! Guards, seize him! But the guards gaped in wonder as the horse rose from the floor and soared away. Out over the fields and mountains, the prince and princess flew. After many hours, Prince Prama looked below and saw the palace of his father. The enchanted horse had brought them home. The king was delighted to see his lost son and welcomed the princess. Prince Prama told his father that Serena had consented to be his bride. The happy king released the owner of the horse and granted him a part of the kingdom in exchange for the animal. Later, when Prince Prama and Princess Serena were married, the king gave them the mechanical animal as a wedding gift. The young people rode away to have many more wonderful adventures with the enchanted horse. Advertised in Boston, New York, and Buffalo, 500 brave Americans a whaling for to go singing. Blow your winds in the morning and blow your winds, my ho! Clear away the running gear and blow, blow, blow. Well, it was in the winter of 1818 that we set out to hunt the great sperm whale. Our ship was named the Globe of Nantucket, and our captain was George Gardner of the same. It was a chill and bitter day when the command came. All hands forward! Man the capstan! Jump to it there! So we bent to the handspike, and slowly the anchor rose while the men sang. All on the bowling, our bullish ships are rolling. All on the bowling, the bowling. Sail swung round, filled to the wind, and we cut through the dark, icy waters. We was fitted for two years' voyage. Think of that, you land lovers. Two years at sea, in the hard, dangerous work of chasing the whale. It's now we're out to sea, my boys. The wind comes on to blow. One half the watch is sick on deck, and the other half's below singing. Blow you in the morning, and blow you in high ho. Clear away the running gear and blow, blow, blow. And we all thought of how rich we'd be. For a ship full of oil and bone, it had many markets. Oil for lamps, for lubricating, for medicine. That was the wealth the whalers brought home to America. 
And on we sailed into the southern seas and down to Cape Horn. Week after week we cruised, looking for our prey, but not a whale was to be found. They'd all been killed or driven from these grounds. to see what Captain Gardner would do. Put your helm a starboard, Mr. Whittle, if you please. All right, sir. Helm a starboard. His decision was made. We were steering westward into the Pacific. Westward into the unknown waters that no whaler had ever ventured on before. Tell you of the clipper ships that go in, in and out And say you'll take 500 sperm before you're six months out Singing, blow you into the morning and blow you in my hole Clear away the running gear and blow, blow, blow All day, the man in the crow's nest, he watched the water until his eyes ached The rest of us was at our work on the ship And then, one sultry day, came the cry from the masthead the cry for which we'd been waiting. Fire shovels! Fire shovels! She breaches! Fire! She breaches! Fire away! On the leaving! Fire the And in a moment we were in the water, throwing for them, straining at the oars like... A strong stroke together! And then, Straight as we forward. neared our whale, his great strong hump back stroke. rising out of the water before us, Straight the mate in our boat cried to the harpooner... The harpooner jumped up, balancing his long spear. Give it to him! And at the cry, the harpoon shoots out, and the whale is caught. Up goes his tail, and he sounds into the sea, dragging the line with him. What's the line? We dashed water on the line with our hat. Now the mate stands ready with his lance. Up comes the whale again to the surface, dragging our boat. Haul in! Haul in! As we draw nearer to him, the mate darts out his lance. The whale is ours! And then we caught the whale, oh, the whale, oh, the whale, oh, and then we caught the whale with our quick harpoons. The whale, oh, the whale, oh, how quiet was his tail, oh, and then we caught the whale with our quick harpoons. And then we caught the whale, oh, and then we caught the whale, oh. Well, day after day we sighted whales, for the waters were thick with them. And when we turned homeward, we knew that we had opened new ground, and we brought back more oil than any other Nantucket ship before us. Yes, we had opened the way for all to follow, ships that would one day cross all the oceans and open up the whole world. All hands up anchor for home! And now that our old ship is full, our cats so great and grand, we'll head on all our stunsels and sail for Yankee land, singing. Blow you into the morning and blow you in my hole. Clear away the running gear and blow, blow, blow. When we get home, our ship made fast and we get through our sailing. A winding glass around we'll pass. We're finished with our whale and singing. Blow you into the morning and blow you in my hole. Clear away the running gear and blow. In a faraway land, there one time lived a shepherd king who owned many flocks and had many shepherds who tended sheep for him. One day, this king wanted to call all of the shepherds together, so he sent a runner for them. When they arrived, the king spoke to them and said, Pay heed, ye shepherds. Henceforth, when I call ye, I will no longer send a runner. 
For look, I have fashioned for myself an instrument made from the horn of a ram. With it I can make many tones. So hark, shepherds. If you should hear me playing this, Come home at once. This instrument we will call a shofar. Soon, each shepherd made his own shofar, and each made up his own call. They all made a set of calls so they could speak to each other. And while the sheep grazed, one could often hear the call of the shofar echoing from hilltop to hilltop. Later, when the king became mighty, he had an army, and the shofar was used to call men to war. As time went on, men learned to work with metals. Soon, they found that horns could be made of brass and gold and silver. These horns could play many more tones than could the ram horn. So the kings had trumpets made to play their special calls. They also found that if they made a trumpet long, they played low notes like this. And when they made the trumpet short, they played high notes like this. Now, in England, there lived a king named Richard the Lionhearted. And when he made ready to go forth with his army of knights, he would call his band of trumpeters and say, Ho, master of the trumpet, sound off. And the master of the trumpet would reply, I am a lord. Trumpeters, prepare. Sound the tucket. <laughs> then, as the king and his knights marched into the great cathedral for prayer, the trumpets could be heard playing music like this. in the 18th century, a wise musician said, we need many trumpets because each one plays only a few notes. Now, let me see. If I make a trumpet with a piece of metal that moves up and down in a pipe and put a hole in the side of that piece of metal, I can use it to connect the different pipes to my trumpet. When I push it down, air will go through a long pipe and make a low sound. And when I let go, the air will go through a short pipe and make a high sound. Now, he had a trumpet with a valve that played many tones. Later, trumpet makers built a trumpet and put three valves in it. Musicians found that they could play all of the notes in the scale. One day, a musician brought his trumpet to the king and said, Sire, I present to you a new invention, a three-valve trumpet. The king looked at the instrument curiously and said to the musician, Play that instrument, musician, and let me hear what it can do. So the musician raised the trumpet to his lips and played a tune like this. very pleased, and the musician was greatly rewarded.
Once in the forest on the shores of the great lake we call Lake Michigan, lived an Ottawa Indian boy. The boy had a name, but everyone had forgotten it. They called him Lazy Bones, but they said it with a smile. For the boy wasn't really lazy. It was just that he was always watching, always wandering by himself. Sometimes he would watch the women pounding corn into meal. Sometimes the boy watched the men before a hunt making arrowheads out of flint. But the boy didn't help them. Instead, he went by himself, far into the woods, always quiet, always watching. He saw where the red squirrel hid its nuts. He saw where the deer drank and where the wolverine left his big paw marks. He had one friend, a little girl named Gray Fawn, and he told her stories about the woods. The woods and I understand each other. The trees are my friends. The birds and bees are my friends, and the animals come at my hands. One morning, Gray Fawn went to gather berries, and by late afternoon, she had not yet returned. The men of the tribe found her moccasins near the lake, but they didn't find Gray Fawn. The chief, her father, cried angrily, she must have been captured by the Saginaws. The men painted their faces and prepared for war. <laughs> While the men prepared for war, the boy called Lazy Bones went to the shore where Gray Fawn's moccasins had been found. He said to himself, if Gray Fawn had been captured, she would have dropped her berry basket. I don't think she was captured. I think she took off her moccasins to go wading. He looked along the shore until he found a footprint in the mud. He said, she came out here and couldn't find her moccasins. He sang, my woodland friends, tell me where is Gray Fawn? Which way did she go? Oh, tell me, please, that you know and your signs I will follow to her. Oh, Gray Fawn and I are your friends. When the boy sang the song, a porcupine that had been gnawing young willow shoots stopped and stared at him. The boy said, I think Gray Fawn went this way to gather willow splints for a basket. He looked and he found places where the willow shoots had been broken. He followed the trail among the willows into the forest. My woodland friends, tell me where is Gray Fawn? A squirrel ran down a tree trunk and stopped, his nose pointing. The boy looked and saw where Gray Fawn's bare feet had disturbed the leaves. Which way did she go? A rabbit jumped out of some bushes, and the boy looked and saw where Gray Fawn had pushed through. He thought, she knows she is lost and is too frightened to look where she's walking. Oh, tell me, please, that you know and your sign I will follow to her. Gray Fawn, Gray Fawn. Just then a flock of crows began to scold angrily. The boy went to the noise for he knew that crows will scold when they're disturbed by someone who has no weapons. There, under a tree, he found Gray Fawn. The boy took Gray Fawn by the hand and they set out for home. See, there! And when the men saw the children, they laughed with relief and joy. And the chief, Gray Fawn's father, put his hand on the boy's head and said, Now I will give this boy a name. I will call him Little Hawk, for he has the sharpest eyes of all the Ottawas. <laughs>
once upon a time, high in the highest tower of the faraway city of Glickenglocken, there was a wonderful clock. The numbers on its face were inlaid with precious jewels, and its hands were carved of purest ivory. And to mark every hour, one silver cock crowed. Two brass trumpeters came out and played. And a little golden angel sang. Dawn is here, time won't wait. The sun is rising in the heaven. Start the day, be not late. The hour is seven, it is seven. The people of Glickenglocken were very proud of their wonderful clock. So proud were they that no one in the city had a clock or watch of his own. Across the river from Glickenglocken stood the ugly city of Dumburg. Now the wicked king of Dumburg had always wanted to conquer Glickenglocken, but he was afraid to attack. Suddenly the king cried, Hmm, I have it. I'll stop their big clock, and without watches or clocks of their own, they won't be able to tell the time. Everything will be thrown into confusion, then I will strike. So the wicked king of Dumburg sent his boldest henchman into Glickenglocken to stop the clock. Slyly, the henchman crept close to the tower, just as the clock was about to strike. The hands of the wonderful clock pointed to three as he tiptoed up the steps. Quietly, he took a big hammer from under his cloak. Listen all, hear the shout of children running fast and free. School is out, school is out, the hour is three, the hour is... The clock was stopped. Yes, the big clock was stopped. Its hands pointed to three and moved no more. Then, just as the wicked king of Dumburg had planned, all over the city of Glickenglocken there was terrible confusion. What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? Should we work? Should we work? Or should we stop? Or should we stop? Should we open up the store to close up every shop? The wicked king brought his army to a high ridge just across the river, and there behind the hill they waited while things in Glickenglocken grew more and more confused. Is it late? Is it early? Goodness, what a hurly burly. Is it early? Is it late? What's the hour? What's the date? Maybe it is time for bed. Get up quick and work instead. What has happened to our town? The wicked king cried, Now is the time! Over the bridge and Glickenglocken will be ours! Swiftly his soldiers advanced toward Glickenglocken, and just as they reached the middle of the bridge, everyone stopped. They looked up. Hear me well. wonderful clock is magical. Yes, Captain, and the magic has saved our city. To the bridge, man! The soldiers of Glickenglocken rushed to the bridge and drove the wicked king and his army back into Dumburg. And to this day, if you visit the faraway city of Glickenglocken, high in the highest tower, you will see their wonderful clock. Its hands still point to three, but every hour, by some strange magic, the one silver cock crows. Two brass trumpeters come out. And the little golden angel sings. Seconds fly, minutes 
flow and hours into days and years swirl. Time speeds by. All should know that time is precious. Use your time well. El Toro Diablo weighed 2,452 pounds, 6 feet 8 inches tall, if you do not count his horns, which are 3 feet long, and the brave matador Juan Pablo Garcia Miguel, weighing 53 pounds, 3 feet 2 inches tall, if you do not count the at, which is 4 inches high. The fight will commence after the march of the Toreador. Senores y senores, it is time to start the big fight. Here comes El Toro Diablo. And now, here comes Juan Pablo, carrying only a red cloak and his wooden sword. Poor Pablo, poor Juan Pablo, at full fighting he must be good. For there he is alone with the great big bull, and his sword is and now, El Toro rushes Juan Pablo. Ah, what form, what grace. Juan Pablo steps aside as El Toro rushes by. Uh-oh, here he comes again. Caramba! Juan Pablo stood his ground and the bull barely missed him. What bravery, what skill. And here comes the bull again. El Toro seems to be tiring. Here he comes. And boys and girls, Juan Pablo has ignored his sword and thrown the bull to the ground with his bare hands. And El Toro Diablo, the biggest bull ever to enter the bull ring, is just lying there. He is afraid to get up. And now, Juan Pablo pulls him by his orange and rides the bull around the ring. Hola! Strike up the band! In Spain, in the town of Caramba, Seville, lived the bravest matador of them all. His name was Juan Pablo Garcia Miguel. He was three feet and two inches tall. When night cast a cloak on Caramba, Seville, Juan Pablo would run to his bed. 
long time after God had created the world and made man and all the animals and birds, he noticed that people were no longer kind to each other and that they didn't obey God anymore. So he was angry. But God did see one man in the world who was kind and good and who obeyed the Lord's word. This man was Noah. So God appeared to Noah and he let him hear his voice. And the Lord said, Behold, I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. I will bring a flood the earth to destroy all flesh and everything that is in the earth shall die. But God told Noah to build an ark and to take two of every animal in it with him to keep alive during the storm. And when Noah had heard God's voice, he was grateful. And he set to work right away to build the ark. This was a great boat with many, many rooms in it. When Noah finally finished it, he went out into the fields and woods, for he had to talk to all kinds of animals and birds. He talked to the lion and the wild horses. He talked to the pigs in the barnyard and the elephants in the jungle and the cute little kittens in his own house. Noah talked to all the animals on the face of the earth, even to the doves cooing in their nests. And Noah picked a mother and a father of each kind of animal and bird, and he told them to come to the ark. Well, when they were all gathered there, you can imagine what kind of a noisy crowd poor Noah had on his hands. What with lions roaring and pigs squealing and monkeys chattering and hyenas laughing, well, it must have been noisier than a crowd of children on the annual Sunday school excursion. But Noah was wise and gentle, and he understood about animals, so he got them lined up in a long row, two by two, and then he started them up and into the ark through the big door in the side. Uh, the bees were the last to go in. Because bees have a stinger in their tails, and no animal wanted to get in line behind them. Noah stored food in the boat, and then saw that his wife and his sons and their wives were safely inside. Then he shut the big door behind him, and he bolted it so that no one could get Then there was a flash of lightning, and the thunder roared as it never had before. Big black clouds hid the sun so that it was almost as dark as night. And out of those clouds came the greatest rain the world has ever known. It lasted for 40 days and 40 nights, as God had promised Noah. All the land was covered with water, and not a house or a living thing remained anywhere. But Noah's ark floated on the surface of the waters, and he and his family, and the animals who were in the ark with them, were saved. On the 40th day, the rain stopped and the sun came out. The waters that had covered the earth began to flow back into the oceans and the rivers, and the ark came to rest on the peak of a mountain. But Noah wasn't quite sure that there was enough dry land for all his animals to live on. So he took one of the doves and let it fly out of the window. In a little while, it came back, and in its beak, the dove carried the branch of an olive tree. Noah knew that this must be a sign from God that he had restored quiet and peace to the world. So he opened the door of the ark, and he and his family and all the animals came out on the dry land and they praised God and thanked him. Then the Lord appeared again to Noah. He promised him that he would never again send a flood to destroy the earth. And he sealed that promise with a beautiful symbol, which is set in the sky for all of us to see. That symbol, the token of God's everlasting faith in man, is the rainbow.
Panchito. Panchito. If you will look at the first picture in your teletalkie, you will see a little burro. His name is Panchito. He's the little fellow with the big ears. One little chicken, she clocked. <laughs> the little goose, he honked. <laughs> and the little pig, he squealed. <laughs> but when Panchito tried to bray, out came nothing. He tried and he tried, but no hee-haw. And right away, the little animals made up a song about him. Panchito. He is a good little burro, but he cannot bray. Cannot he, cannot haw, it is awful. Panchito. The gooses and geeses, their nephews and nieces all say. What a shame, such a shame. Too bad for the parents of no Panchito. Panchito has ruined their name. Panchito. Ay, poor Panchito. His heart was so heavy like a stone. He was so ashamed, he ran away and climbed to the top of the highest mountain. And when he got there, what do you think he saw? A little eagle in his nest. The little eagle was crying. So Panchito, he said, Hey, little eagle, why do you cry? And the little eagle said, I cannot fly. And when an eagle cannot fly, there is much to cry about. And when Panchito heard this, he said, Ay, you poor little eagle. You are almost so bad off like me. I am a little burro, and I cannot pray. I, you poor little burro. Do you mind if I cry with you? No? No, little burro. Let us cry together. Thank you. <laughs> and after they could not cry no more, each felt so sorry for himself and for one another, they decided to jump off the mountain and end it all. <laughs> Well, Panchito and the little eagle did jump off the top of the mountain. But as they were falling down and down, suddenly the little eagle called out. Look! Look, my wings, they're flying. Flap your ears, little bird, and fly like me. I can't. I can't. And the ground kept getting bigger and bigger and closer and closer and more bigger. But just before the ground got big enough to hit Panchito, the little eagle grabbed him by the tail. <laughs> And Panchito made a one-point landing right on the tip of his nose. And the little eagle, he said, Little burro, you know what? You brayed. No, no, I did not bray. Oh, but you did. You only think you cannot bray. Like I thought I could not fly. So if you think you can bray, you can bray. So what you think? Panchito did not know what to think. But he thought he ought to think, and maybe think some more. In the meantime, at the village, a big fiesta was commencing to begin. The little chicken was practicing her clock. The little goose was practicing his honk. The little pig was warming up his squealer. The band was playing pretty music, and everybody was happy. That is... Everybody but the papa and mama of little Panchito. And they were very sad. Oh, my poor Panchito. If we only had him back, we would not care if he never prayed nothing. <laughs> Listen, papa. What is it? And when the papa burro looked to see, there was little Panchito standing beside the little chicken, the little goose, and the little pig. And when the band did play, you never did hear such music. For Panchito, he joined in and brayed. Hee-haw, hee-haw. Now, little.
little Panchito makes the biggest and most beautiful hee-haw in all Mexico. <laughs> Which goes to prove, if you think you cannot, you cannot. But if you think you can, you can, I think. <laughs> Bunyan was just one month old. He placed his baby hands around a young maple tree and tore it out of the ground roots and all. When he was only 18, he was already 25 feet tall and weighed 800 pounds, all bone and muscle. He took one look at the deep forests of the West and found his job to chop down the trees to make room for cities, farms, and people. Come all you sons of freedom that run the forest stream. Come all you roving lumberjacks and listen to my theme. We'll cross the roaring rivers where the mighty waters flow. And we'll roam the wild woods over and once more a lumbering go. And once more a lumbering go, and once more a lumbering go, we'll roam the wild woods over, and once more a lumbering go. Paul Bunyan was so tall, he covered miles with every step. Why, one day he started walking across the country. He walked across Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and then stepped into the state of Wisconsin. There, he met an old farmer, his head bowed down with grief. The farmer told Paul his story. I'm going down the road feeling bad. Oh, my crops have failed and now I'm feeling sad. My family is hungry and we have no place to live. I'm going down the road feeling bad. And with five blows of his axe, Paul Bunyan cleared a space of 10 miles for a brand new farm. Thank you, Paul Bunyan, cried the farmer. You're welcome, said Paul, as he took an extra big step and walked from Wisconsin into Montana. Yes, Paul Bunyan did some remarkable things, all right. As a soldier in the Revolutionary War, he faced a whole line of cannon. As the Hessian soldiers fired at him, he picked up a tree trunk and batted their cannonballs right back, like baseballs. Once, when pirates were roaming the east coast of the United States, he splashed his foot in the ocean and started a wave that sank the whole pirate navy. Oh, and I almost forgot, he also built the Rocky Mountains. Paul grabbed the hill with either hand with a ring ting a tim ring a tin on a and set them down so they would stand in a row. He built the Rockies up so high the topmost peak held up the sky with a ring ting a tim ring a tin on a. Then came the biggest job of his life. The country had no inland waterway large enough for big ships carrying heavy freight. So, Paul Bunyan began to dig. Soon, he had scooped out hundreds of miles of earth. Now, he wanted rain, so he clapped his hands together. And down poured the rain. 
until the holes in the earth were filled with the Great Lakes. Now, one of the Great Lakes was named Lake Erie, and the town of Buffalo was on its shore. It took just another day's work for Paul Bunyan to dig the Erie Canal from Buffalo to Albany, and the inland waterway was completed. In his later years, with his big jobs done, Paul Bunyan went back to one of his favorite hobbies, mountain making. But this was a mountain for children, a rock candy mountain. All the buzzing of the bees in the popcorn trees near the chocolate ice cream fountain where the jelly beans grow and the milkshakes blow down the big rock candy mountain. Oh, the children eat their fill of the whipped cream hill and no one's ever counting. There's so much to eat. Life is one long treat on that big rock candy mountain. Did Paul Bunyan really live? Well, nobody knows for sure. Oh, mighty Paul Bunyan, he lived long ago. His strength and his goodness helped America grow. In the forests of the South lives a quiet, friendly little animal with a sharp nose and a long tail called the possum. Not equipped by nature to be a fighter, the possum has another way to protect himself. When trapped by the hunter's dogs, he plays dead, and the dogs leave him alone. Little Peppy Possum, the hero of this story, sings about it. When the dogs are near, a possum plays dead, and he lies sprawled out like he fell on his head. He doesn't move a muscle, he's as still as can be. He's playing possum just to fool him, you see. When the dogs go home, possum blinks his eye. Then he flips his tail, bids the dogs goodbye. But the dogs don't hear, cause they're far away. Old possum don't care, he likes it that way. That is, all possums but me. I'm a little possum who won't play possum. I don't like to stay too long in one place. I'm a little possum who won't play possum. And I like to lead the dogs a merry chase. Little Peppy Possum's father worried about his son. And one day, he took him aside for a little talk. Uh, Peppy? Yes, Pappy? Peppy? How come you don't play dead when the dogs are chasing you? I just don't scare easy, I reckon. Who's scared of old hound dog, Pappy? Oh, I can tell you that, Pappy. Who, Pappy? Your Pappy, Pappy. That's who. But Pappy just laughed and ran off into the deepest part of the forest, looking for danger and excitement, for adventure. I guess my Pappy means well. But he doesn't have to worry about me. I'm smarter than old hound dog. But suddenly, without warning, out from behind a bush jumped Major, one of the biggest, most ferocious hound dogs in the forest. <coughs> well, well, who have we here? Lil Peppy Possum, I do declare. Ha, 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 howdy, Major. Well, I enjoyed our little talk, but I gotta go now. Bye. Hold on there, Peppy. Gotcha. <laughs> you leave go my tail, Major. You hear me? I don't like it. 
And if I don't let go? Well, I reckon I'll just have to learn to like it. I'm a taking you home to my master. He just loves possum stew. Oh, Pappy, Pappy, why didn't I listen to you? You were right, and I was wrong. Poor little Peppy Possum. He was being dragged away, and there seemed to be nothing he could do about it. Old Major, the hound dog, was dragging poor little Peppy Possum to his master's house. Peppy, not wishing to become the principal ingredient of a possum stew, decided to do something about it. He relaxed all his muscles, which made him heavy and hard to drag. Here now, how come you're so heavy all of a sudden? Don't you go to sleep now? I know your possum tricks. No, Major, I'm not asleep, but I am sleepy. Hum, hum. And before long, I'll be sound asleep. And then I'll be so heavy, you'll never be able to drag me. Never, huh? Never, unless you listen to what I got to say. I got a plan. Now, about a half mile from here is a little old brook full of nice, cold water. Nice, cold water, huh? That's right. You go and get some, then bring it here and throw it on me. That'll make me wide awake, and then you can drag me home. How do I know you won't run away? You don't. Then I'm not going. Well, in that case, I better get on with my home sleeping. Wake up, Peppy. You wake up now, you hear? If you go to sleep, you'll be too heavy to drag home. I'll do what you want. I'll go get the nice cold water. As soon as Major left, Peppy, who wasn't sleepy at all, of course, climbed up to the top of a live oak tree. Here he waited until Major returned. Hey, hey, you, Peppy Possum, you come right down out of that tree. I got you some nice cold water. I sure am sorry I caused you all this trouble, Major. But I don't need it anymore. <laughs> Oh, Peppy, you make me tired. Tired, eh? Then throw the cold water on yourself. I feel fine. This little possum was sure scared today, and I thank my stars that I got away. Dogs taste a possum, it's for nature, too. So a possum's got to do what he's got to do. Oh, I've learned that dogs are something to fear. When they're around, I'd better stay clear. Or else I'll play dead, as my pappy advised. Playing possum's not bad, I just realized. Many hundreds of years ago, the good King Richard, known as Richard the Lionhearted, left England to take part in the Crusades, the war against the heathens who had captured the holy city. In his absence, he placed his brother John on the throne. As soon as he was king, John turned on the good nobles of the kingdom, stole their goods, and drove them out of England. Among these nobles were the old Earl of Huntington and his son, Robin. Father, I've come to say goodbye. Robin, where are you going? To Sherwood Forest. King John has declared me an outlaw, and an outlaw I will be. In Sherwood Forest, Robin Hood banded together with other young men like himself, banished by the wicked king. Men like Will Scarlet. Outlaws we are, Will Scarlet. 
but outlaws such as never were before and never will be. Just how do you mean, Robin Hood? I mean this, Will. No, let me show you. Do you see those two fat men coming down the road? I see them. A couple of merchants, rogues and wealthy. And do you see that old woman in rags, weeping in sheer hunger? I see her too. Well, watch. And keep a hand to your arrow in case I need help. And so quickly, they became known far and wide. Robin Hood and his merry men of Sherwood Forest taking from the evil to give to the poor, defenders of the weak and oppressed, the one hope of England's people. Sometime later, Robin set off by himself in the forest. He started across a bridge which lay across a stream, a bridge consisting of a single log of wood. But facing him, blocking the way, was a stranger, a tall man with broad, powerful shoulders. I'm afraid there's only room for one of us to cross at a time. I think it ought to be the better man. Stand and fight! <laughs> with only wooden sticks as weapons, they fought long and hard. Finally, with one quick, powerful motion, the stranger knocked Robin Hood into the stream. <laughs> Well done, fellow. <laughs> what, what do they call you? John Little is my name. John Little? <laughs> well, I'll call you Little John. And I want you to join my band as my next in command. And now the band of merry men was complete. And just in time, for King John had posted a reward of 10,000 pounds for the capture of Robin Hood. And none was trying harder to win that reward than the Sheriff of Nottingham. Robin, I have news. The Sheriff of Nottingham is staging an archery contest with a golden arrow as the prize. A golden arrow? What a prize. His purpose in holding the contest is to lure you there. Ah, uh, that may be, but I shall go anyway, in disguise. <laughs> You, that beggar over there, get out of the way. I? Why, I'm one of the marksmen, sir. You? A marksman? <laughs> That's rich. <laughs> one by one, the finest bowmen in the land shot their arrows. Finally, one arrow lay in the exact center of the circle, a bullseye. Hey, Not yet competed. You? Well, maybe it will bring us a laugh. Robin let fly. <laughs> a perfect shot right on top of the arrow in the center, splitting it down the middle. Robin had won. A shot like that? Only one man in all this land can shoot so well. Robin Hood. After him. Catch him! But the sheriff was too late. Robin was already speeding back to Sherwood Forest. As Robin entered the forest, a knight appeared and challenged him. In the midst of their battle, the knight suddenly put down his sword. Enough. Enough. I didn't recognize you. What? Why, it's your majesty. King Richard the Lionhearted, back from the crusade. Robin Hood, your exile is over. You and your men, come back to your homes. But Robin Hood and his men declined the king's offer. They preferred to remain in Sherwood Forest together, living their adventurous lives, taking from evil men to give to the poor. Oh.
cold winds of autumn blow the leaves from the creaking branches of big trees, then winter is on its way. Many, many years ago, there lived in a faraway country named Greece, a soldier, Artemis, and his little boy, Plino. One day, Artemis took Plino on a hunting trip. When nightfall came, they were far from home. It was warm. Plino and his father found a haystack, and there they went to sleep. Later, Plino awoke. It was black and cold. He reached out to touch his father, but Artemis was gone. Plino heard something moving in the dark. Then he recognized the steps. It was Artemis. Artemis had found some wood. He started a big fire. Lad, he said to Plino, we've been caught by winter. Plino moved close to the fire. He thought for a moment. Then he asked, why, father, is it not always summer? Well, Artemis said, I'm not sure I know exactly, but there's an old story. Get in closer to the fire and I'll tell you. There was a time when all the days were summer days, and the grass was green, the flowers grew, and the birds sang all through the year. And in this happy time, there was a young girl named Prosperine. She was beautiful, gentle, unafraid. And she was so kind that even wild animals were tamed before her. One day, Prosperine wandered far from her home into a strange valley. She came to a very old tree. Around its gnarled trunk grew a vine bearing flowers of deep flashing colors. Prosperine picked some. They were hard to carry, so she took off her cloak and dropped the flowers in it. She was so busy with what she was doing, she did not hear the soft sounds of a huge man who moved quickly, quietly behind her. Then for a second, it seemed to Prosperine that the valley was more quiet than silence itself. She turned. There was a man, tall and broad as a door. His hair was dark. His skin burned hard and brown by the sun. His eyes were black as night. He was Stygis, the soldier they called the Dark Prince. Once he looked at her, Stygis knew that Prosperine must become his princess. Throwing his tunic over her, the huge Stygis slung her on his shoulder like a sack and ran through the valley to his hidden castle in the caves. So quickly did the dark warrior move that Prosperine had not time to cry out, but only to hold tightly to the strange flowers in her hand. When night came and Prosperine had not returned home, her mother Ceres became worried. She threw on her cloak, took a lantern, and went out in search of her daughter. Morning came. Ceres found herself in a strange valley near a very old tree. There on the ground was Prosperine's cloak with beautiful flowers laid carefully upon it. But Prosperine was gone. Ceres wept for her lost daughter, and as her tears fell to the ground, she cried, May the earth be cursed and cold. May no flower, leaf, or blade of grass be green again until Prosperine returns to me. And the sun was low in the sky. The land grew cold and no flower bloomed. Ceres never gave up searching for her daughter. One day, she stopped before a brook that came from under the big caves nearby. Looking down into the stream, Ceres saw flowers of deep flashing colors, like those from the strange valley. Ceres whispered, if Prosperine be returned to me, then shall the earth be green again. Finding an entrance to the caves, Ceres quietly crept along the cavern walls. Far in the distance below, she could see the dim lights of the castle in the caves. Her foot touched a loose stone. Before she knew it, 
Stygis warriors were at the bottom of the cliff, climbing up after her. Ceres called, bring Stygis to the bottom of the cliff, for I, Ceres, mother of Prosperine, would speak with him. Stygis came quickly, bringing Prosperine. Ceres called, Stygis, free Prosperine, or I will hurl myself off this cliff, and Prosperine shall die after me. The black eyes of the dark prince glowered. He did not know what to do. Finally, he said in his rumbling voice, half the year Prosperine may be with you, Ceres, but half the year she must be with me. Ceres looked down and saw the pale, beautiful face of her daughter, Prosperine. Ceres called after Stygis. All right, Stygis, half the year with me, half the year with you. And so it was. When Prosperine was with Ceres, the spring came and the world was green. And when Prosperine went to the castle in the caves, the barren winter visited the world. That, Plino, is the story of the seasons. But Plino didn't hear, for he was fast asleep beside the roaring fire. begins in the ancient country of Persia in the city of Baghdad. One day a porter carrying a heavy load stopped to rest near a beautiful home. He looked at the splendid house and said, how is it this man has so much and I have so little? Why is he so fortunate and I so unlucky? The porter did not realize someone was at the window above him. Bring me that man. Two servants seized the frightened porter. But I didn't mean any harm. Please, where do you take me? To the greatest sailor of all time, Sinbad. He would speak with you. So the poor porter was brought before the owner of this fine house, Sinbad the sailor. Spare me, O oh master. <laughs> do not be afraid, my friend. I heard your remarks as you rested, and I would like to tell you a story. A tale you will never forget. Please be my guest and feast with me while I tell you of my adventures. As a young boy, I was very poor, but I was determined to search for my fortune. I decided on a sailor's life and signed on as a deckhand on the Golden Fleece. She was the most beautiful and fastest ship that ever outraced a pirate craft. I sailed for many years, learning the business of shipping and trading, waiting for the day when I would own my own boat. One day, we were caught in a typhoon and blown far off our course. A giant wave washed me into companions overboard. We clung to a log for a while, but soon we were separated in the storm. Then, night fell over the violent sea. I swam until I found myself on a strange beach. Confused and frightened, I wandered into the jungle and became lost. Finally, I dropped from exhaustion. Suddenly, I was no longer moving. The raft had stopped. Then I saw why. A monster 20 feet tall had grabbed the raft and was lifting me up in the air. He had one huge eye, large ears, and an ugly mouth. The hideous creature paralyzed me with fear, for I expected to be killed at any moment. The beast took me to his nearby cave and dropped me into a cage, and I saw what my fate was to be. There, tied to stakes, were my two shipmates. The monster was going to cook and eat them. I couldn't see any way of escape. My only hope was to distract the giant somehow. Then I thought of the jewels. While the beast gathered wood for our barbecue, I fashioned a string of dazzling gems. When he returned, I dangled them to attract his attention. The flashing almost hypnotized the monster. He opened the cage door and grabbed the tantalizing jewel while I slipped out. Quickly, I freed my friends, and we ran for the river in my raft. The eye of the creature was only interested in the sparkling toy, which he had now placed about his neck. But we didn't know how long that would be. Just as we reached the ocean, we heard the roaring of the monster as it came crashing through the jungle, looking for his runaway dinner. He saw us and started wading out faster than we could push away. The jewels sparkled as he moved. Just as he was about to grab the raft, a great shriek stopped him. 
as he looked up. The rock had missed the jewel and had seen them sparkling on the giant. The battle was on. While the two monsters fought, we frantically pushed far out to sea and drifted away with the current. The next day, we were picked up by the Golden Fleece. I had enough jewels to make the entire crew wealthy. I was able to buy my own sailing ship and prospered as a merchant and trader before I settled here in this home. And so, friend, you see, I earn my fortune in a great adventure. For listening to an old man's story, I present you with a gift. The wealth this jewel will bring you will remind you of the famous Sinbad the Sailor.
for me, Sparky. <laughs> of the Mississippi River, there once lived a boy named Tom Sawyer, who caused his Aunt Polly more trouble than a barrel of catfish. Tom Sawyer, you broke Judge Thatcher's window today. That toe's not sore, Tom. Get up and go to school. Tom Sawyer, stop where you are or I'll box your ears. Tom? You call me Aunt Polly? You broke the cookie jar. Truth was, Tom's mind was on other things, which he soon told to Bill Harper. Bill, meet me tonight down at the riverfront. What do you aim to do, Tom? I'm not Tom anymore. I'm the Black Avenger of the Spanish Main. You'll be the terror of the seas. We're bold, brave river pirates, starting tonight at midnight. Look, a campfire on the island. Somebody's here. Run for it, Tom. Back to the boat. Oh, pirates don't run from trouble, Bill. Come on. Let's find out who's at that campfire. Creeping to the campfire, the pirates came upon two men quarreling with each other, Dr. Robinson and Injun Joe. A third man, a tramp named Muff Potter, was asleep nearby. Suddenly, the engine drew his knife and struck the doctor down. Quickly, the engine put the knife in the hand of the third man dozing near the fire. Why, the engine's gonna blame someone else. That tramp, Muff Potter. He'll be arrested for sure. Like startled deer, the pirates sped back to their boat and swore each other to secrecy. Only three of us know the truth, Bill. If we talk, that engine will scalp us. Muff Potter was arrested, and it looked as though the truth would never come out. Then one day, Muff Potter's lawyer hauled Tom Sawyer to court and dragged the truth out of him. Now, under oath, point to the man who used this knife that night on Jackson's Island. Point him out. It was him, there by the window, Injun Joe. <laughs> Sawyer, Engine Joe's free, and he'll be after you, because now he knows you saw that fight on Jackson's Island. Weeks passed, and when Injun Joe failed to return, Tom Sawyer grew braver. Then, one day he confided to his girl, Becky Thatcher. It was a black box full of money, a real treasure box. Well, that's what Doc Robinson and Engine Joe quarreled over. I heard them, so I know, Becky. Where is the treasure buried? There's an old barn on Jackson's Island. 
must be buried in there. Let me go with you. Nope. Girl's bad luck on treasure hunts. You're just scared. I'm not. I'm hunting for that treasure tonight with Bill Harper. Ready, Terror? Ready, Black Avenger. Start digging in that corner where the floorboard's loose. Treasure might be there. I'll stand guard. No sooner had Bill started digging than he struck something hard. Tom, I found the treasure. I found it. But just then, Tom ran back from the doorway. Bill, let it be. Quick up the ladder to the loft. Somebody's coming, and I think it's Injun Joe. <laughs> Somebody try steal money. <laughs> I feel Carefully, Tom spliced their pants and shirts together, then tied one end to a beam. Soon, they lowered themselves to the floor. Leg him for the river now, Tom. Wait a minute. Injun Joe must have headed for the cave on the other side of the island. He's gonna rebury the treasure there. Let's go after him. Not me. I'm going home. Not long after, a ferry boat took a picnic crowd to Jackson's Island, and Tom invited Becky Thatcher along. Do you really think Injun Joe hid the treasure in the cave, Tom? Well, I'm not sure, but it would be a good place. Why don't we explore it right now? Suddenly, Tom tripped over something, fell to his knees. Becky! Look what I tripped over, the treasure. That's wonderful. Now let's go back. Wait, I can't see the entrance to the cave anymore. Becky, we're lost. Grimly, Tom and Becky wandered underground. They had almost given up when they made a turn in the passageway and then... Look, a light. There's the entrance, we're safe. Later on, Tom told the townspeople about the cave. They were sure Injun Joe would return to get his treasure, so they set up a guard and waited. One day, he returned and was caught. I give up. I go peaceful. Tom had helped catch Injun Joe, so he was a hero. And he had his share of the treasure, too. But all the money in the world couldn't keep him out of trouble nor keep him from having more adventures. Peace and Troy were locked in a long, bitter war. The Trojans had captured a beautiful Greek princess named Helen and held her within their fortress city of Troy. It did not seem possible that any man could break into the fortress city of Troy. For days, weeks, months, the Greek soldiers from their camp on a beach near the city assaulted the walls of Troy, but they were always beaten back. Then Ulysses, a great leader of the Greeks, said to his men, I have a plan. It is dangerous, but if it works, the Trojans themselves will take us through the gates of their city. At the order of Ulysses, the Greek soldiers set to work cutting down huge trees, making the wood into planks. From the towers of Troy, the Trojan soldiers watched a big building grow taller and taller day by day until it was six stories high. And when the Greeks pulled away all the work ladders and scaffolds, there stood a huge wooden horse, 80 feet tall. All along the towering walls of Troy, the soldiers and the people gathered to look out across the plain at the great wooden horse. They wondered what it was for, what it meant. The Trojans did not know that Ulysses and five Greek soldiers lay hidden in a dark secret passage inside the wooden horse. All 
through the night, fire blazed brightly on the beach. The Greeks were burning their tents, just as if they were giving up their camp and sailing back home. When morning came, not a Greek ship or soldier remained. But where they had camped stood the great Trojan horse. The Trojan people poured out of the city to the beach, so they could look more closely at the structure over the Greeks. The Princess Cassandra, daughter of the king of the Trojans, warned her people of this Greek gift, but no one would listen. The Trojans decided to pull the great horse inside the walls, into the city of Troy itself. The Trojans tied thick ropes around the legs of the huge wooden horse. Hundreds of men took a hand at the ropes. Others lined up behind the horse. Whooping and hollering, laughing at the Greeks who had never been able to scale the towering walls of Troy, the Trojans tugged and pushed and pulled the huge wooden horse slowly from the beach, over the plains, and through the gates of Troy. In the dark, secret passage of the wooden horse, Ulysses and the five soldiers lay quietly waiting. They could feel the horse being moved. What the Trojans had decided to do, neither Ulysses nor his soldiers knew. Suddenly, after a whole day and half a night, the Trojan horse moved no more. An hour passed. Still the horse did not move. Ulysses gave a signal. The soldiers felt their way silently down the dark, secret passage, following Ulysses. Cautiously, he opened the trap door. Just as he hoped, the Trojans had brought the horse inside the walls of Troy. The city was sleeping now, and the walls were unguarded. Ulysses drew his sword. He ordered the soldiers to follow, and he dashed for the main gates of the city. The Greek soldiers quickly tied the sleeping Trojan guards, while Ulysses scampered up the sentry tower. Holding a torch high above his head, he signaled to the Greek army, which had turned around and sailed back to the beach during the night. And even as Ulysses and his men opened the gates of Troy, the Greek army was marching across the plain. Caught completely by surprise, the Trojans were easily defeated by the Greek soldiers who found their beautiful princess and took her back safely to Greece. And brave Ulysses was named the greatest of the Greek heroes.